how do Horcruxes even work? Hey, brother. So look, I know we here at Super Carlin Brothers really like to get deep in the weeds on all the profound lore within the wizarding world and really stretch the ideas and magical creations to their near breaking point. But today we're returning to wizarding basics. I just wanted to try and take some time to really navigate the various ins and outs of one of the most central and otherwise important, but sometimes confusing magical maneuvers we see within the entire saga the Horcrux. In the simplest terms, a Horcrux is the process of removing a small portion of your soul and placing it inside of a container or vessel for safekeeping. I think we all get that much. But then how that Horcrux works in a practical sense, I think is a little less obvious. Like, are they supposed to come back themselves like the diary does? Could Harry as a Horcrux have become Voldemort since he's already a living being? Or like, what about Nagini? Or Ron, he was wearing the locket for a while. Was he like a few bad turns from going the same way as Ginny in Chamber of Secrets? Or is it more like a cat with nine lives? Like you're immortal as long as you're not defeated once for every available Horcrux. Then there's the weird question of, could there be multiples of you? Like if the diary almost brought back young Tom Riddle, could there have been several Voldemorts at once? Do all of the Horcruxes share that particular ability or was the diary just uniquely capable? You see what I mean? Like while it appears straightforward, there is a ton of room for misunderstanding. And I think the diary specifically is responsible for a lot of the confusion around it because it does come back to life on its own or almost, which spoilers is not how they're supposed to work. But don't you guys worry, today we are going to get to the bottom of all of it. All right, Horcruxes. First, let's just cover the basics. How are they made and what's the point of them? You know, for all you aspiring dark wizards out there, for, for the record, I wouldn't recommend uh, ever making one because it's just a really bad idea. And you're gonna like, you know, destroy your soul and probably turn evil and be a menace to society and just a net negative for the world. So not recommended. <laughs> Either way though, the nitty gritty details of how they're made is not actually known to us muggles. Other than that, the person making the Horcrux must first commit murder in order to split their own soul. At that point, they are then able to perform some kind of spell that will transfer the ripped piece of soul into another object, which then becomes a Horcrux. And its function as a Horcrux is to anchor the living person the soul came from to this side of the mortal realm and keep them from dying. But how does that work? Does that mean that they can't be killed? Well, yes and no. Hermione probably gives us the best explanation of it in Deathly Hallows. Look, if I picked up a sword right now, Ron, and I ran you through with it, I wouldn't damage your soul at all. Which would be a real comfort to me, I'm sure, said Ron. Harry laughed. It should be, actually, but my point is that whatever happens to your body, your soul will survive untouched. But it's the other way around with a Horcrux. The fragment of soul inside it depends on its container, its enchanted body for survival. It can't exist without it. And yes, I know what you're thinking. Spot on Hermione, but please hold your applause. The point is, the act of having a Horcrux doesn't mean you're incapable of taking physical harm or even that your main body can't be destroyed. It just means that you can't die. So like in Voldemort's example, when he tries to attack Harry as a baby, his Avada Kedavra spell backfires and ends up destroying his physical body entirely. But his soul survives the encounter because of the Horcruxes. But Instead, the Horcruxes stop it from going over and keep him in the mortal realm. The issue he then has to deal with for the next 13 years is that he doesn't have a body to inhabit and walk around with and has to exist in that like weird mist vapor form. And believe it or not, the same would have been true if, let's say, I don't know, like one year old baby Harry had just been like wielding a sword and managed to get you know, a good swing at Voldemort's neck and just completely decapitated him. Which I agree, it's unlikely, but I like to think he had it in him. You'd make a fair beater. If that had happened though, for one reason or another, the outcome would have been the same. You'd have a dead Voldemort body, but an intact soul that just gets left behind as vapor. I do think it's worth noting though that while you're in the vapor form, your soul is 
trying to die at all times and is only not dying because of the Horcruxes. Like if you can imagine the veil, that big archway that Sirius falls to, it's almost like it's, it's trying to suck that soul through at all times, but the other Horcruxes are just like literally anchoring it to this side. Actually, I don't know if that made it more confusing. The veil has nothing to do with it, but like just for a visual representation. Anyway, the point there being that if Harry had managed to like destroy all the other Horcruxes before Voldemort had gotten his body back, then that would have finished him off. But after Voldemort does have the body back, then you are required to kill that body as well. That's sort of the situation Voldemort finds himself in after Neville kills Nagini. Like he has no more Horcruxes, but he doesn't immediately die because he does have a body. And guys, now we need to get a brief pause right there to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Let's talk about relationships, y'all. They come in all shapes and sizes, and sometimes you have multiple different kinds of relationships with the same person. Like, take Ben, for example, here at Super Carlin Brothers. We're brothers, friends, and business partners. Not in that order. <laughs> No, definitely in that order, but each of those relationships comes with its own benefits and challenges. And at times it can be like changing gears. We might have a tough day at work, but then be in a family cookout the next day in a whole new context. Now, at times this might seem like walking a tightrope, but both Ben and myself work hard in therapy to try to distinguish between these various roles by setting clear boundaries, learning how each of us communicates, and then building trust and respect inside of that communication. And I would absolutely credit therapy for helping make all these relationships with just this one person work so smoothly in a world where we interact in so many varying capacities. And that's just my brother. I mean, relationships are everywhere in our life. And if any of yours needs some TLC, consider giving therapy and better help a try. Become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Just visit betterhelp.com slash super to get, to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash super. Link is in the description down below. Now, a big misconception people have is that the way a Horcrux stops you from dying is by coming back to life itself. As if, hey, it's okay if you kill me over here because a different version of me will just come back to life wherever I hid my Horcrux. If that were true, it would mean that you'd have as many lives as you do Horcruxes, but that is not how it works. In fact, even just a single Horcrux could stop you from dying and infinite number of times. If let's say Harry, Dumbledore, or Regulus never discovered the locket and it just remained hidden in the cave forever, that single Horcrux could stop Voldemort from dying forever. Harry could chop Voldemort's head off, light him on fire, blast him with a vodka Kedavra, like you name it. Anything that would kill Voldemort's body, he could do. And he could do it over and over and over, but it wouldn't matter. Well, I mean, it would matter some. Voldemort would have to go through the entire process of getting his body back each time he, you know, died, which would be arduous and difficult and painful and stupid, but his ripped, tattered soul would never die. He always could come back. Like, that is the power of even a single Horcrux. The confusion comes in because of what happens in Chamber of Secrets when the diary Horcrux tries to come back to life on its own, like, why does that happen? Well, there's a couple things to consider. First is that the diary is unique in that, according to Dumbledore, it is intended to be used as a weapon, meaning to be used to open the Chamber of Secrets and purge the school of Muggleborns. But it's also worth considering that the diary coming back to life is not the intended use of it. I mean, consider that neither it or any of the Horcruxes make any effort at all to revive themselves the entire time Voldemort is defeated. The diary is unique because Ginny starts writing in it and from there it is able to learn the fate of Voldemort Prime and take actions into its own hands. If it had come back, then yes, it is possible there could have been two Voldemorts at once, but it's pretty unlikely that either would like allow the other to exist. Both would view themselves as the stronger one and the other one as the threat and would like try and probably destroy the other one. Or actually it's more likely they'd probably just try and turn the other one into a Horcrux as of course they would consider parts of their own soul like the most precious thing in the world. At that point, Voldemort would really find himself stuck between, well, him, himself and a soul place. So there's, there's, that joke exists somewhere. 
I don't know if I got it right. Now you also might wonder like, if that was the case, couldn't one of them just absorb the other? And the answer is technically yes, but actually I don't think Voldemort in particular could. Because if we go back to that conversation with Hermione, isn't there any way of putting yourself back together? Ron asked. Yes, but it would be excruciatingly painful. Why? How would you do it? Remorse. You've got to really feel what you've done. There's a footnote. Apparently the pain of it can destroy you. I can't see Voldemort attempting it. Can you? So if like young Tom Riddle wanted to absorb Voldemort Prime into himself, then Tom Riddle would have to feel remorse and we know that he is just not capable of doing that. Like Harry even offers it to him just before the final battle and he straight up refuses. The consequences of which, by the way, are that when he, you know, dies, he gets stuck here in limbo rather than truly dying, which really actually would have been like its own kind of mercy. But what about the other Horcruxes, you might be wondering? Like, could they have come back as other versions of Voldemort? And like, obviously we can't know for sure, but I don't think so. I mean, like, take the ring, for example. How could anyone ever form a relationship with the ring in the same way that Ginny did with the diary? I mean, like, if you put the ring on, it kills you. I suppose the locket does learn quite a bit about Ron while he's wearing it, and it does put up a very good fight before it goes down, but at no point is it actually trying to become a new Voldemort. Like, everything it does is simply to prevent itself from being destroyed. Like, even when it just senses the sword nearby, like, it tries to drown Harry underwater. As for the cup and diadem, sadly, we don't really know what would have happened if they'd interacted with them more, but I'm betting if you drank from the cup or, you know, put the diadem on your head, you'd be dead. This is all because the main goal of any Horcrux is to not be destroyed. Like, bear in mind, each part of the soul in any given Horcrux would know the plan to be immortal and try to accomplish this goal, and all of them are pretty cunning at it. Another odd question we get a lot is about the fractioning of the subsequent souls each time Voldemort makes one. Like, if he splits a soul in half for the first one, then both Voldemort and the diary have half a soul, right? But then if he does it again to make the ring, does Voldemort Prime and the ring each just have a quarter of a soul? Because if you follow that line of math, it means by the time Harry is made a Horcrux, he is only getting 1 64th of Voldemort's full soul, which would feel like a good explanation for like why maybe the Horcrux doesn't affect Harry that much, you know, it's just such a small sliver. But also, hilariously, this would mean that by the time Voldemort comes back in Goblet of Fire and has made Nagini, that he, Voldemort Prime, would only have a 1 128th size soul, meaning Harry would actually be more Voldemort than Voldemort? Actually, actually, while we're here, fun fact on this point, Voldemort's goal from the beginning is to have a seven part soul, which he actually unknowingly accomplishes when he tries to kill Harry. But rather ironically, the moment, the very moment he has a seven part soul is also the exact moment he becomes his all time weakest. I think that's hilarious. What a dumb plan. Either way though, the fraction theory is not how it works. Like I can't, I can't explain the metaphysics of it all, but each Horcrux and Voldemort Prime all always have the same amount of soul in them. And then as Harry destroys them, there's just less soul overall. And also, also the reason the piece of soul in Harry doesn't affect it that much is because Harry's soul is so pure that the Voldemort part of him just doesn't really stand a chance. So. But anyway, that just leaves us with how to destroy a Horcrux. And it's like Hermione says, you have to destroy the container beyond repair. That is why they have to use the Basilisk Venom and can't just, you know, smash each Horcrux with a hammer or melt it down. Like, sure, you could break it in half, but the soul would still survive. But honestly, you probably couldn't even break it or melt it if you wanted to, because after Horcrux is made, the wizard in question will have also then added a lot of extra enchantments and protections to the object to prevent such mundane forms of destruction. And it's those protections that often make the object so deadly. Like, take the ring, for example, that almost kills Dumbledore. The fact that the ring is a Horcrux isn't what kills Dumbledore. It's the curse Voldemort put on the ring after he made it a Horcrux that does that. 
Think, for example, of the curse on the opal necklace that Katie Bell touches. Like, that isn't a horcrux, but it is still a deadly object. So Voldemort will have turned the ring into something just like that to stop anyone from destroying his horcrux. Although, actually, now that I say that sentence, the opal necklace came from Borgen and Burks, which is where Voldemort would have been working when he was making his third and fourth horcrux. So, like, maybe, maybe it's not, it's not his horcrux, but what, could it be somebody else's? Did Voldemort see the opal necklace and start adding other protections? I guess it already would have been the ring, but... Mm -hmm. Because, actually, hear me out here, he is wearing the ring at school. So, I wonder if he, like, added that protection to it later after he saw the opal necklace. Ooh, that's like a, such, such a tiny little mini theory. Me and Ben are literally talking about it right now as we're recording. <laughs> Either way, it's not to say that the act of being a horcrux doesn't make something dangerous. I mean, Voldemort puts way less protections on the diary, for example, because he wants someone to write in it and become subject to its influence. And obviously his soul in it alone just wreaks all sorts of havoc. But I guess at the same time, I don't think Harry or Ginny could have like destroyed it with just like a regular fire or something. I think he did put some protections on it. It's just not like if you touch it, you die. It's more like if you touch it and write it and connect with it and open the Chamber of Secrets and kill a lot of people, then you die. Hey, that's what happens almost. But I think that pretty much covers it. That is how Horcruxes work, how they are made, their intended function, and how they are destroyed. If I did miss anything though, or if you have any more questions, be sure to leave them in the towel section down below and we'll see what we can do about answering them. But guys, thanks so much as always for watching today's video. Don't forget to leave a like on it if you haven't already and subscribe so you don't miss any future Harry Potter content from us. If you have not been keeping up with what if James had just kept the invisibility cloak, we are going to be finishing off that series this week. We are going to have part five coming out on Friday. So check out uh, the beginning right here so you get caught up. Otherwise, until next time, Ben, I will see you in another Life Brother.